What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to another video. Let's do one more portfolio review. And it's actually gonna be my last video before we head home. Our flight is later tonight, <clears throat> this evening, so we're just getting some last minute packing in. And I just wanted to quickly slap this together so you guys have a little something while I'm kind of getting back into Canada time zone. But for those of you that gave the feedback and support on that last review, like you guys really, really liked it. You guys really enjoyed it. I saw the comments. I saw all the love. Mark is actually working behind the scenes right now to kind of get a, a system in place or to make this more of a recurring episode, if you will, a recurring series, which was, you know, requested by you guys. So you'll have to ask him or stay tuned with what his plans are for submissions, yada, yada, yada. But I did just get an email here on November 5th from Ramulo, actually someone named Fernando, who is uh, one of our students in the academy. This is a example of a good portfolio. Obviously, maybe a little bit biased here. I'm still going to critique this portfolio as fairly as I can. But that last video was more or less like penny stocks, mistakes, down over $8,000, a lot of beginner mistakes. Well, Fernando here has built the portfolio, in my opinion, in a stellar fashion. We're going to see exactly how we can contrast and compare. If you guys enjoy, give this video a big thumbs up, but let's get into it. Hi, I'm Brent. Hi, Brent. I'm Fernando, one of your students in the academy. A couple days ago, I watched your video where you shared a portfolio that was down $8,000. I have a couple similarities with this investor. I am also 34 years old. So if you recall that last guy was, I think, 33, 34. I'm an immigrant who arrived three years ago and my portfolio was around 29,000, which is like almost identical. This is like a spitting image of that other person. I think this is a good case study because my portfolio is only down 1500 versus the 8,000 from that other gentleman. Enjoy your vacation. I hope to hear from you soon. Rebulo. Key details here on the right to summarize. We have 34 year old investor from Moncton, New Brunswick over on the East Coast. Not that that really matters, but they have an RSP worth about 10 grand. They have a TFSA of about 17 grand, bringing essentially their, their book cost, the amount of money they've put in at about $30,000. He says 29,000 here, but my math suggested 30,000. And with the market going down today, or as of November 5th, excuse me, looking at this portfolio, it was sitting at about 27,000. So I calculated here a loss of about 2.3K. So a bit off from the 1500, but that, that's regardless, I would say that is very, very, very uh, impressive in the big scheme of things. Not sure how correct my math is, but I think that's a decline of about 7% on the total portfolio, which as we know, the stock market in general, if you were just an S&P investor, if you were benchmarking to the S&P, this year, as of uh, November, 5th, November 4th, was down 20%. So this is actually a portfolio that is significantly beating the market on the downside. It's just, just as important you know, everyone wants to beat the market on the upside, but building in downside protection and making sure you don't drop as much when the stock market drops is equally as important, if not more. And I think this portfolio has done an amazing, amazing job of doing so. So well done, Fernando. Let's move over to this exact uh, page. Everything is exactly how he sent me, other than the fact that I just kind of listed some pros here, some cons or critiques, some takeaways, and I've attached some pie charts just to make it a little more easier to see, okay? But let's start with an overview. They own uh, SVR, which is a silver bullion ETF. They own S&P 500 fund. They own Bell Canada and Toronto Dominion Bank. This is the RSP, excuse me. So in their RSP, they own two individual stocks. Then they have an international ETF. iShares Core MSCI EFE, EAFE index ETF. That's 10% of the portfolio, giving them international exposure. They have a Canadian fund, which is the S&P TSX cap composite, a US market fund. And then they have a few... Uh, income funds, which would be Harvest, Diversified Monthly Income Fund, we've covered on the channel. Hamilton is another producer here in Canada, or they have a bunch of Canadian options. Uh, very, very popular, actually, when it comes to these covered call ETFs. And then they have a Vanguard REIT ETF, and then a BMO a High Dividend call uh, covered call ETF. In the tax-free savings account, very similar story. S&P 500 fund coming in at the highest weighting, 26%. Hamilton ETFs, uh, Harvest ETF, a TSX cap composite index ETF, aka the Canadian market another international ETF here just replicating. And then they have Fortis as their individual hold as well as Walt Disney. So we see at 4% and then at 2% of the weightings, they have uh, two uh, individual stocks, Canadian and US. Then they have a TSX 60 index, which is just a smaller Canadian index. And then uh, we have uh, a REIT index and then a BMO aggregate bond index. So, and let's start with this total return of this portfolio. We see nothing like that last one where there's those 60, 70, 80, 90% drops. You take a look at the returns that this investor has experienced 
and these are all so, so manageable. This is what we would love to see. We'd love to see our portfolios like this during a down market. My portfolio is even down further than this because I've built in more aggressive selections, but we see these portfolios, uh, these positions, excuse me, down in the single digits. Basically their worst performing uh, position is this REIT index. So the Vanguard uh, FTSE REIT, uh, yeah, REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust ETF down about 24%. Here in the TFSA, we see very similar story. Worst performing stock is Disney, which is their individual stock selection. But we see everything else is pretty much just right in line with the markets. Again, it's tough to know exactly when this investor started. That's one thing that I think we should get, gather from, you know, submissions is when you started investing, because it's it's tough to, to guess, right? Um, what I would guess is, you know, the fact that their S&P 500 fund is down 15%, right? Similar to how I did with that last person. If we, if we look at the S&P 500, we have to make that assumption that they started investing probably within the past year. I could I, like, so if year to date, it's down about 18%, it's very possible that they started investing, you know, beginning part of this year, uh, late last year. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know. And I'm basically just guessing, right? So tough to say. And that's something that maybe Fernando, you can clarify down below how long you have been investing for. Nevertheless, let us get started with this review. First thing that jumps out to me with this is the build of this portfolio, primarily ETFs. We do see a couple individual stocks, but in that last video, we had it kind of the other way around where the guy had so many individual stocks, too many individual stocks for a new investor and a very small percentage of ETFs. And I was saying, maybe for a first time investor, you want to switch that around. Well, you take a look at what Fernando has done here. In the TFSA, they own 92% ETFs. Huge check mark there. And they've still thrown in or they're they're dabbling in with individual stocks, but it's not gonna make or break the portfolio. Now, the good thing about Fernando is you look at the types of company he's he was selecting between a TD, between uh Fortis, I believe it was, the Bell Canada was another one. These are great selections of companies too. That's a pro that I'm gonna give Fernando. He's selecting not only great stocks, but also great ETFs. But conceptually from a construction standpoint, I love to see the bulk of the money in ETFs. Then the the, the peripheral of the portfolio is in stocks. It's not to say this is how it's gonna be forever, right? This not It doesn't have to always be forever like that. But for your first year in the markets, when you're learning, this is how you want to do it. And just to share with you guys my background, for, for those of you that are new to the channel, like I started investing in mutual funds. So think about that, not even ETFs. Mutual funds, which are essentially the same type of diverse basket product. Then I transitioned into ETFs over the years. Now I've been investing for 15, 17 years of my life. And now my portfolio is individual stocks. That doesn't just happen overnight, that is a transition. And I did start investing, you know, when I was 10 or 11, I did own a couple stocks, like literally a share or two probably of McDonald's and Coke, just to get that feel under my belt. And I like the fact that this is exactly what they're doing here. They have their ETFs, their products that they know are gonna be diversified and pushing them forward, but they do still sprinkle in a couple of shares of individual stocks. Uh, I think this is just the right way to do it, in my honest opinion. I'd also like to take into account how well this portfolio is constructed from a geographical standpoint. So we notice here that this investor has selected all Canadian ETFs, which is a big stamp of approval there. Again, when we can choose Canadian listed ETFs, for the most part, that's what we want to do. But if we do actually take a breakdown, and I'm not going to go through and literally do a breakdown, but just from a top level, we see here 18% of the fund is in uh, the American market, right? S&P 500. We see two Canadian stocks. So these would obviously give them Canadian exposure here with Bell Canada and TD. We see 10, 11% of the portfolio is invested in the international markets. If you recall that last investor, I forget their name, but the last one we did like last week, they had zero international exposure. They had very little Canadian exposure. The portfolio was entirely built up pretty much of US tech right? It was those PayPal's, it was this, it was a bunch of small caps. There was very little diversity versus you look at a, por a portfolio like this with your US exposure, your Canadian fund, you have your EFI fund, I mean, your international fund, excuse me, you have another smaller uh, tax exposure to the cap composite index, you have a US total market fund, you have exposure to things like REITs here. So even getting exposure to assets beyond stocks, I mean, you could still classify a, a, 
a REIT as a stock, excuse me, depends on how you want to look at it, but giving you exposure to the real estate market. And then you, this investor has even baked in uh, an income strategy clearly throughout both, por both portfolios by adding in things like the Hamilton and Harvest diversified monthly income funds, baking in some covered call income into these portfolios. So when you look at that diversity of how well this investor has decided to build it, this is how a portfolio should look from a diverse standpoint. And what I love about this investor is like, like our models that we teach in the academy, he's gone out and selected funds beyond that, meaning he's got the knowledge to stand up on his own two feet and bake these into his, you know, I keep saying the word bake, but he's he's making that assessment of his personal situation and picking investments, picking funds to, to suit that. You guys know me, I'm not a huge fan of REITs myself. I don't even have a REIT a, a, a ETF in my portfolio. I'm also not a fan of silver, which we're going to talk about in a moment uh, when we get onto the critiques. But nevertheless, this I like it, it. It makes me very happy to see an investor like this who is able to stand up on their own two feet and build the portfolio to their liking. That's how it should be done. So very, very well done. I'll also just say one thing too. Argument that comes across is like, why would I not just buy via V? Right? You see on Reddit, you see these like handles. They just say, oh, if I'm building a portfolio, just like VFV or VGrow and what is it? VGrow and chill, right? You've seen those ones? VFV and chill, VGrow and chill, essentially just buy one ETF and just chill. And that is a very suitable strategy for a lot of people. If you want to be hands off and you want to be very, very passive in your investing experience, the data shows that that is going to be a strategy if you dollar cost average and you just continue doing that for the next 30 to 40 years that you're going to do very, very well. What an investor like this has done is with the knowledge and with the interest in being a little more hands-on in your portfolio, he's clearly constructed his portfolio of multiple ETFs for various different sectors. Now, the benefit to doing this, in my opinion, if you know what you're doing, is this does provide you with a lot more flexibility and a lot more opportunity to essentially drive alpha, if you will, if that's the term you want to use, to essentially inch out extra gains as an investor that you can't do if you're simply just buying a one fund portfolio. So what I mean by that is that let's take Fernando, for example, let's assume every paycheck, every two weeks or every month, he's putting money into his portfolio, which I assume that he is. That's what you want to be doing for the bulk of your life where you're kind of growing, uh, you know, growing and accumulating your portfolio and assets for your future. Well, each time money comes into his account, he can then direct that money to where he feels it is suited best. Let's just go hypothetical example. Let's assume Fernando feels, oh, my REITs, you know, REITs here in the Canadian market or the US market or the international market is actually showing more value than the, than the, the US market. Internationally showing more value than the US market. Or hey, these small cap stocks are actually looking more attractive than the large cap stocks right now. Whatever the case is, when you have a portfolio of multiple ETFs, you can then deploy that money into the areas that you feel are offering the best value versus of course if you just did a one one fund portfolio like vfv for example you're literally just buying vfv no matter what you're buying it on highs you're buying it on lows you're buying it every single day it doesn't matter and again that strategy does work but this is like that next layer of 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 control within your portfolio. And of course, from a diversification standpoint, you can build a portfolio as you please. You can pick ones that that represent what you're looking for. And this investor clearly puts a priority on income. We're gonna talk about that actually too in just a second. But overall, very, very pleased with how this looks, guys. Take a look at these pie charts, they're awesome. I'd hope they'd be pleased again because this obviously was someone that came through our, our program and they were learning how to structure a portfolio properly. But from the great stock selections, both stocks and ETFs, big check mark there, no junk stocks in the portfolio. Uh, asset breakdown, that again is kind of like the ETFs to stocks. I think he's right on track there. And then the geographical mix is perfect. I think in both portfolios, having about 11 to 10%, 10 to 11% weighting in international is where you want to be. I take me, for example, I'm about, you know, what is it, 10, seven, eight years younger than this person. No, no, I'm about five years younger than this person. Five years younger than this person. So in my later 20s, he's in his 30s, mid 30s. I actually have chosen, I've opted to be more aggressive and my exposure to my international expo international stocks is higher. That's just a personal preference. This person maybe doesn't feel comfortable with that. So they've capped theirs at about 11%, uh, 10 to 11% in the international markets. You want to be exposed to these markets, but you don't want to be going gung ho. And I think that he is right on track. Now let's move on to a couple critiques because again, as, as much as I'd love to just hype this up, I want to give this a fair critique, right? And I want to say, 
this is some things that I notice. And the first thing is just more or less a housekeeping thing to get out of the way. Maybe just, Fernando, why do you own such small amounts of these three uh, ETFs? So for example, I look here at a ZWC, they have 0.17% of the portfolio in there, a total cost of 20 bucks, 18 bucks. I would just scrap that. You already have enough uh, covered call exposure through your other products. And even if you did want to add a BMO one for, for down the road, which is another great provider, like I have nothing, these three providers are all stellar, but it's just like, why do you have that clogging up space, clogging up mental energy? Same goes here. You have two very small positions. I'm in the belief that with a portfolio, you want to keep it clean. You want to keep it tidy. You want to keep it like nice to look at. So, uh, yeah, just get rid of those. In my opinion, again, this is not investment advice. This is just what I would be doing unless you're like actively going to try to build these up, but I'm just confused why these are even there in the first place. The major thing that sticks out to me, and I don't want to say it's like a red flag, but it's like, we take a look at the RSP and 20% of it is sitting in a silver bullion fund. So we see the biggest chunk of this pie chart, 20%, nearly a quarter of the portfolio is sitting in this silver fund. Now, it's so tricky again to try and figure out when this investor bought this, because I see here a return of 1%. This is essentially traded flat. We see a market price, we see a cost price of 981. And yeah, so this is ticker SVR, SVR.TO stock. This is where it'd be very valuable for me to know when you bought this, right? It's very possible that they recently bought the stock. Like if you literally bought it at like within the past few months, well then of course, you know, then it's very likely that you're gonna be trading flat, right? You've just been like, you bought it, it hasn't really gone anywhere. It's possible that if you bought it at 931 and you did start investing late in the pandemic, you had a nice little boost and it's actually been propping up your portfolio. This fund, in comparison to the to the S&P, which a lot of investors just have the bulk of their money in, most investors are down 10, 15, 20% this year alone versus this fund has clearly done a good job of propping up that portfolio if it has been one that you've held, you know, let's say over the past year. Now, possibly this is a stock that you just added for some reason. And if you did, it's clear they're trying to make a play, maybe on the market, maybe on this recession. Assets such as gold and silver is kind of like, kind of gets tied into that. But a lot of investors do feel that it is a safe haven, a safe asset to be in when the world is kind of going to crap. That's possibly their mindset. It's possible that they are using this as somewhat of a hedge to the falling market. And if that's the case, I mean, clearly, Fernando, it's worked out very well. And that's, again, I don't want to speculate, but like it's worked out well, unless you just initiated this position. What I would say personally for me, and this is just for me, but I would not feel comfortable having 20% of my portfolio in a single commodity, especially one as volatile as silver. I've always had a little rule for my portfolio, like it's literally written down as part of my portfolio constraints and whatnot. I cap my, I cap the upper ceiling of my ex commodities exposure to 10%. That's the most that I ever want it to be. And in, in most cases, my commodity exposure is like more on the long lines of zero. So I'll maybe buy a barrack gold here and there, or I'll maybe buy some sort of company or ETF to give me some slight exposure, but it very, very rarely exceeds 5%. And I think right now, actually, I own no commodities. It's not a field that I follow too closely. It's not one that's ever excited me all too much. In fact, based on my experience, I've only ever really gotten burned by investing in the gold market and the commodities market. So it's something that I just personally tend to kind of not follow all too closely. So I'm probably not the best person to give input on this silver position and whether it's a good position to hold or not. But one thing that does jump out at me is that 20% regardless does sound kind of high. And maybe Fernando, you were well aware of that. You're essentially making a play. And if so, that's okay. But what I would say is just make sure that within your realm of, you know, your portfolio constraints and your plans and what you're willing to go at, we could look at it like the ceiling or the upper band of where you're willing to go within each area of your portfolio, just make sure that you are on top of that, that you, this is okay with you, a 20% exposure to uh, silver is is okay. But that's one thing that jumps out at me again, maybe he knows m more than we do, because clearly he's uh, outperforming actually, to put it simply, he is outperforming the market. So just one thing I put out there. One more thing that does jump out to me, uh, Fernando, is if we do look at these funds, I don't know if you've done this on purpose or not, but if you look at, for example, at like, let's just look at the TFSA and I see this fund, which is the TSX Cap Composite Index ETF, ticker XIC, iShares, essentially Canadian market exposure. And then I see a fund like XIU, which is the S&P TSX 60 index ETF, right? And 
combined, these make up about 15%. So you have 11% here, 5% here. My question to you is, was that split up on purpose? Like, did you decide to go with the two various Canadian funds and kind of treat them as your Canadian exposure? Did you duplicate that? Based on what I'm seeing, I actually think this is a really, this investor is actually quite intelligent. They've done a very good job of researching their own funds and uh, building the portfolio. Again, I would say like very, very well. So I don't even think this is a mistake. I think what they've done is actually put the bulk of their money, for example, in the TSX cap composite index, and they've taken a little percentage of their Canadian exposure and broken it down into another fund for further diversification. If that's the case, well then, hey, that's a great, great little decision there. But it could also be the case where you have overlapping funds. And if that is the case, I would just t look to maybe consolidate that. I notice it's the same with the US fund here. So for example, you have XS, XUS, which is the S&P 500. And then you also have the total market fund, VUN, right? And it's like very similar idea. You put about 20% here and then 5% here. So like 20 in like the big stable you S&P 500 fund, and then you've added something into the total market fund. In my opinion, these do have a lot of overlap. So like, let me explain what I mean by that. If we go XIC ETF, which is the iShares uh, TSX cap composite index, and then XIU ETF, which is the S&P 60, right? So for those that are not following along, these are both Canadian ETFs, like literally giving exposure to the Canadian market. This one here, XIC, gives you exposure to the entire TSX index. This one gives you exposure just to the top 60, right? That's why it says 60. So the 60 largest Canadian uh, ETFs, uh, Canadian stocks are included in this ETF. And for the most part, these are gonna perform the same because if we look at the holdings, like this is just comes from understanding of the Canadian market. The Canadian market is like really quite small in the big scheme of things, like it is. Because whether we're looking at the entire market fund, so this is the, the full TSX or the TSX 60, I mean, this fund is going to be owning the exact same things. Like we see even very similar percentages, Royal Bank, TD Bank, Ambridge coming at 764%. This one is Royal Bank, TD Ambridge coming at 653%. So it's like basically the exact same fund. Of course, this TSX cap composite index is just going to own a bunch of smaller funds at the end of the day. The question then becomes is like, is this fund significantly better, the top 60 by cutting out those other ones? Well, when you do look at the performance, what I found is that they do tend to be very, very similar. Like they're maybe going to be a percentage point off, half a percentage point off. And that often comes to when these funds are incepted too. So it's hard to like make that fair, that fair apples to apples comparison just by glancing at this. And I'd have to look a little bit deeper, but like 10 year return of 7%, 10 year return of 8%. So maybe it does have a inch, you know, inching out, inching out of a return. But typically why I say this could be room for consider consolidation is fees this fund is definitely a little bit more expensive than you know just your broad-based index fund when you just look at a broad-based index fund whether it's the canadian market or the tsx i mean or the s p when you're just buying the broad market we see how cheap this is six basis points we see here the mer goes up to 18 basis points so is that going to make or break you know they're both very cheap funds at the end of the day these are just something to consider is what i'm trying to get at okay and again it made it it may, it may be the case that you actually strategically did that and if so i think that's very very cool what you've done you yeah let's say you want 15 percent exposure to the Canadian markets 10 5 percent you want 25 exposure to the u.s markets 25 5 percent just to get initial diversity but i would just say you know in the case that you were aiming that was by accident and then these are overlapping funds you could just consolidate and just have it all in one line keep it simple but other than that very 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 well well done I would say one thing too is, uh, especially in the RRSP, I, I like the fact that you own BCE and uh, Toronto Dominion Bank. So you've ex you've shown that you are open to ho holding individual stocks, which I think is great. I think it's a great thing to do. And over time, you continue to do that. I think in the RSP in particular, very favorable stocks you could look to add in the realm of holds that you have would be something possibly like a J&J, &J, right? Or a PepsiCo. In these RSPs or in these retirement accounts, we do get taxed better. Like there's a treaty in place where because these are considered retirement accounts, we are actually eligible to collect all the dividends from the uh, US holdings versus if this was in the TFSA, there would be 15% withheld, which is why I'm just getting a little bit nitpicky here. But I'm just trying to like forecast maybe your next steps, you've got a nice batch of ETFs, you're super diversified. But if you are looking for a nice new hold, maybe consider adding like an individual US stock to kind of complement your your two Canadian selections here. Just a thought I'm throwing out there. And I threw in a couple dividend ones that 
I feel like you would maybe be up your alley, but obviously do your own research and due diligence. In this fund, I, I would just say one final thing is like the the thing that jumped out to me here is there's there's clearly a, a priority on, on yield, right? We see here HYLD, HDIF, and then HDIF making up a total of about what is that 30 to 40% of the portfolio in the TFSA. So this investor has structured things to have income in the portfolio. And all I would say is like, just be well aware about what these funds and what their objectives are. I think these are phenomenal funds. Like that's why we cover them on the channel. The Harvest Diversified in a Monthly Income Fund, we just covered last week and my dad's been doing all sorts of stuff with Harvest because they offer great solutions for Canadians. But just make sure that you know what you are looking for out of these funds, if you know what I'm saying. We actually just did a conversation with Adrian, who's an investor that fully dives in to this passive income style of investing. That's all he does. He doesn't care about the capital appreciation and what his portfolio value does. Like his portfolio could go down 20%, 15%, 30%. His objective is building up that passive income stream as high as high as he can and eventually living off of it. And he already is a living case of that. But oftentimes with these high income ETFs that are spinning off seven, eight, nine, 10% yields, the cap, the share price, the, the capital, the value of the stock does go down, but you're getting a lot of income. And you need to weigh that as an investor to say, well, what is it that I'm aiming for? If that is the case, then that is stellar. It's just that for a 33 year old, 34 year old investor, you know, I often find these funds are very well suited for older investors who are like literally like just income is the main priority. But with a younger person like this, I see kind of like, you know, all of your ETFs for the most part are focused on growth and, and expanding the portfolio. And then you have these high income funds, which are then, you know, it's almost like there's two different objectives, if you get what I'm saying, baked into one portfolio. And maybe you're well aware of that. And that's all I'm saying is to just be aware of that, especially if you're taking those dividends and redeploying them back into your portfolio and not just pulling them out. I think that's awesome. For example, you get all this like, you get all these beautiful um, yields and incomes that's coming into these accounts. It'd be phenomenal if you started deploying that into the S&P, which is down 15%, or even averaging down on a stock like Fortis or Disney, assuming you feel those are good stocks to buy. You take that income and then you start putting it back to work in your portfolio. I think that is critical and huge. I would just say something to be aware about and make sure that you are aligned with, like you understand that, that this is part of your strategy. Do you get what I'm saying? But overall, I would say, this is a super, super well done portfolio. And I'm really, really proud to, to look at this, Fernando, and see what you've accomplished and see what you've done. I would give you a round of applause. I would say hats off. You've clearly done a very good job of constructing this. Very little, like I'm giving you pros and cons. In general, I would just say like, hey, this is a great example of a portfolio. And the fact that it's only down $1,500, $2,000, that is indicative of a well-structured portfolio compared to that last gentleman who in the exact same position has lost 8,000 and that's not even that bad. Like there's cases where people lose way more and you've done a really good job. And this is just one year on the big scheme of things. Imagine five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, you know you've got your stuff structured right. Uh, that's just killer, killer, killer. So, hey, thank you, Fernando, for you letting us use your case, uh, your portfolio as a case study. One final thing, I think it's funny how you say, my portfolio versus their portfolio crashing um yeah i guess that's just how they spell it from where you're from with the a the portfolio but nevertheless i just thought that was nice and fun but do appreciate you sending this in for a review and uh, sending this in for an example i hope that for the viewers at home you guys have enjoyed this little review kind of showing the bad in the previous one if you will and then here showing a good with a very similar profiles of investors and that's just like very very fun to, to see that and a good little coincidence but with that said guys I will wrap it up here. Next video you guys see from me will be back at home, back into the swing of things. So I'm very excited for that. If you guys enjoyed, give this video a thumbs up. I thank you for watching all the way through. Subscribe. Make sure you check out Blossom if you haven't already. That's link in the description. You can download for free on the App Store. Or if you do want to check out the Investing Academy, like, like Fernando has and learn to invest properly, like let's just put it that way, learn to invest properly and literally save yourself. Like this is just a small example where someone's down $8,000 versus $15,000 you guys would be surprised at how many people make these mistakes and go out and just do the wrong things in the stock market and it costs them thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars in mistakes that could have been avoided by learning to actually build a portfolio properly and 
I couldn't have asked for a better example here with Fernando. Again, other than saying the silver bullion thing, a little high for my liking, but that's on you. You you make those decisions for yourself. And that's what the whole point of the Academy is, is to help get investors standing up on their own two feet where they can be DIY investors, do their own thing. And hey, Fernando's clearly done an amazing job thus far, so can't slight him too much there. I'm sure he's got some good good ideas for this uh, e the silver ETF, but I guess we'll see with time. But that is that link down below as well. That is the investingacademy.ca. Would love for you guys to check that out. But as always, I thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video. Back at home in Canada. <laughs>